project of my spoon in ten. Can we check this one off? Uh, I'll just turn this off. I think you can just ah. leave it. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for being here for the society. Yes. I was just telling your president, you're the president, of this, is that right? the president, that uh, I was here the first time 25 years ago. Uh, I was still a lay person. Hello, Richard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nice to see you over there. And uh, I was here 25, about 25 years ago, just before I became a monk. Uh, so this is one of the places I found my inspiration for the monastic life. Uh, yeah, so I actually owe a little bit to the Buddhist society. So I guess now I'm back here to pay off my debts, perhaps. So glad you <laughs> I, I remember what happened was that I was actually thinking, I've been thinking for a while about monastic life for a few years. I've been to Japan, I've been around to a few places. So, and I thought, well, I'm living, I'm living in the UK. My parents were living in the UK. My parents were these very Anglophile people that lived in the UK for 27 years. So I was already here. And so I thought, maybe there are some good Buddhist monasteries in the UK. Where do I start? How do I find out? So, so I got out the white pages, uh, got B, U, D, D, and there, lo and behold, was the Buddhist Society of London. Uh, so I called up the Buddhist Society and said, where are the monasteries? Uh, and I said, well, you have two options, Amravati or Chitras. Yeah? Chitras was closer to where I lived, so I went there, uh, and that is how my monastic life started. Uh, so I owe quite a bit, actually, to the Buddhist Society of London right here. So that's actually quite, uh, quite a wonderful thing. So I have a connection. Uh, and uh, sometimes people would say, Maybe there is a karmic connection here. Yeah? Maybe I'm now paying off my karmic debts. This is about karma and rebirth. So am I, have I come back here to pay off my karmic debts? What do you think? Yeah? Is that how karma works? It's one of the interesting things is to see how these words, like karma for example. Karma obviously being an ancient Indian word that goes back you know, to way before the time of the Buddha in India, back to ancient Hinduism and Brahmanism and all of these things and also the uh, Jains also had the word of Kama in the, in the, which they use as part of their religious understanding uh, and uh, to see how these words actually change in meaning over time uh, so if you, look, if you look up in the OED the Oxford English Dictionary today uh, and you read the meaning of Karma it does have the meaning in there which is the ancient Indian meaning of action uh, but it also has the meaning in there of fate yeah, so the way people often use Karma these days is as that's my Karma, it means like that's my fate uh, this has happened to me, it has to be this way. Yeah. And if <coughs> I say it is my karmic debt to the Buddha society here to come back here, it's a bit like using it as a sense of fate. Yeah? You're coming back because you are propelled by this impersonal force to bring you back here. It's my fate to come here. It's like being down in Perth yeah, and the law of karma takes over it and you say, yes sir, to law of karma, go on board the plane, board the plane, fly to London, come to the Buddha society. No choice. Yeah? That's kind of karma. And this is kind of karma as fate. Yeah? But of course, the idea of karma, it does not have anything to do with fate in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, in the Buddhist teachings, karma is about causality. Uh, it is the cause for future uh, feelings in particular. Yeah? So we do actions, uh, intentional actions in particular, and that causes results in the future. Uh, and that is what karma is about. Uh, and um, uh, some of the uh, kind of standard ways of understanding karma in the uh, well, I've already shown you one example already from the OED, which does not fit with the original meaning. Uh, but a lot of ways that the word karma is understood in contemporary society, uh, and this is in contemporary Asian societies, yeah, traditional Buddhist societies, uh, it is certainly in contemporary Western societies, uh, it's a big uh, misunderstanding, lots of misunderstanding uh, of what karma is about. Uh, and one of the things that got me thinking about this when I I uh, started to look at the early discourses of the Buddha, the suttas of the Buddha. Uh, one of the things I remember that really caught my eye was when we had these massive natural disasters in Southeast Asia. We had the famous, uh, the very big tsunami back in 2003 or four or something like that. Uh, I was going to say famous, that was a bit unfortunate word in that case. But we had that big tsunami back then where 150,000 people died. Uh, and uh, the parts of Asia that were most affected by that, the number one part was the north of Sumatra. Yeah, if you imagine the map of the world, you have like Indonesia, you have Sumatra, and the top of Sumatra is called the Aceh province of Sumatra. Uh, and that was devastated by the tsunami. There was 100,000 people or something uh, that died, I think, just in Aceh. And entire villages were wiped out. Yeah? Everyone, the whole family, all their friends, all their mates, as we say in Australia, everyone was wiped out in that village. Uh, and it occurs to you when these things happen, uh, 
is this is it the case that everyone in that village has the same karma so they deserve to be wiped out is that a kind of a logical way of looking at things or is it a different understanding of this that makes much more sense if you ask someone coming from a traditional buddhist background the general understanding is that everyone in that village, yeah, the mom, dad, the, the children, the grandparents and the uncles and aunties or whoever lives there, the kind of all extended families, uh, everyone had the same karma and they had to die at that particular point. Uh, but that, to me, doesn't really make any sense. Uh, that, to me, is stretches cr- credulity too far. Uh, and for me, it was important then to <coughs> check what does the Buddha have to say about these things? Uh, what are actually the Buddhist teachings about this? Uh, so before I go on to that, yeah, I'm going to keep you hanging a little bit there on that cliff yeah, to see what the Buddha has to say about this, because uh, this is kind of a... I, uh, yeah, no. So uh, to uh, start off, it is important to have some idea what are the Buddha's teachings. Yeah? This is so important. How do we actually find out uh, what is the truth in Buddhism? And if you look at Buddhism uh, around the world today, it is so incredibly diverse. Uh, there are so many different types of Buddhism everywhere. Uh, there are, uh, you know, this massive diversity in, in, in scriptures, in practices, in rituals, in all kinds of things. Uh, so how do we know where to find the essence of Buddhism? And for me, the starting point for me was always, what did the Buddha himself teach? Because Buddhism is, after all, all the various branches of Buddhism, all the various schools of Buddhism, all the various scriptures that we have, uh, they are source, the root source, the foundation of all that. Uh, is the Buddha himself. Yeah, it's very obvious. Without the Buddha starting this thing off, uh, without the Buddha's awakening experience, without the Buddha starting to teach, all the other stuff could not happen without that. Uh. So because of that, the Buddha's awakening uh, is the one thing that all Buddhist schools, in a sense, have in common, a sense of faith and confidence uh, that the Buddha actually had some insight into the nature of reality. Yeah, this is the one thing that we all take for granted as Buddhists. Uh. So, what does that mean? And what it means for me, as a Buddhist monk, it means that uh, uh, trying to find out exactly what the Buddha was teaching, uh, to tap into that wisdom that the Buddha had, uh, becomes rather essential. Yeah? Because that is where we uh, hopefully can find uh, uh, remnants of that awakening experience right there in those ancient scriptures. Uh, so how do we go about doing that? Uh, yeah, and this is not going to be some kind of, you know, I'm not going to kind of do some kind of PR job for Theravada, Buddha saying Theravada is better than everything else. This is not what this is about. This is more a general inquiry into how we can find out what are the early Buddhist scriptures. I know the Buddhist society is very diverse. You have members from all kinds of backgrounds. And of course that is in itself very interesting. Is there a way that we can bridge perhaps even some of those, that diversity? What do we have in common in the various Buddhist traditions? And one of the ways of doing this kind of research to try to go back and find out what early Buddhism is all about. Uh, one of the main ways that have been, has been done over the last few decades, uh, it actually started already back in the 19th century, there was an English scholar called Samuel Beale. Have you heard about Samuel Beale? Yeah? Quite a well-known English scholar. He learned Chinese in the early days uh, and he read some of the ancient Chinese mm-hmm. suttas uh, and he was one of the first who discovered that actually in the Chinese canon you find some of exactly the same suttas as you find in the Pali canon. And you find also elsewhere, some in Sanskrit, some in Tibetan, some also in other very obscure languages as well. Uh, so he was one of the first to discover that. And he said, uh, it is astonishing, here we have uh, scriptures uh, that have been separated apart in different schools, uh, separated for maybe 2,300 years. Yeah? One school went to the north of India, then went from the north of India into China later on, got translated into Chinese. Uh, this was mostly the Sarvastivadan school and the Ramaguptaka school of early Buddhism. And of course, other schools went to the south, Theravadan being the main one of those. Uh, and from uh, uh, Kashmir, where the Sarvastivadans were, uh, and Gandhara, where the Dharmaguptakas were, to Sri Lanka, it's about 3,000 kilometers. Uh, yeah, in those days, when you had to go by foot or you had to go by ox cart, uh, ox cart is pretty slow. Uh, yeah, it doesn't, you can't go very far in ox carts. Uh, <coughs> so it takes you a long time to travel 3,000 kilometers. Uh, so basically, the separation goes back to the time of Ashoka. Ashoka lived roughly around 2260, 2260 BC. So we're talking about roughly 2,300 years ago. So since then, these schools have largely been separated. And then Samuel Beale finds these ancients. Imagine the excitement, yeah? Here you are interested in Buddhism. You gather out these ancient Chinese texts. You open them up, you start reading. 
because you must have been a very good scholar in Chinese language, is it? Even people who read Chinese today, yeah, some of you probably read Chinese, uh, can't read this ancient text because the Chinese language has changed so much in the, in the intervene, uh, intervening time. Uh. So he opens these up, and imagine <coughs> the excitement. Uh, when one of the first texts that he reads is the Bhikkhu Patimokkha. Yeah? The Patimokkha is a sequence of rules for monastics. Uh, and he looks at the rules yeah, in ancient Chinese, uh, compares them to the Pali, compares them to the Sanskrit, uh, and they are virtually identical. After 2,300 years of separation, uh, that is rather astonishing. Yeah? And it was not just the Patimoka rules, not just the Vinaya rules that, that you know, these various schools had in common. It turns out that the suttas, many of the discourses of the Buddha, also exist in parallel in the Chinese as it does in the uh, Pali Canon. And after, now about 150 years after Samuel Beale uh, did his pioneering research, uh, we know that essentially the uh, basic suttas that we have in the Pali scriptures uh, they also exist in Chinese, some of them exist in Tibetan languages, some of them exist in Sanskrit, some of them exist in really obscure languages, Uyghur, you know the Uyghurs in, in uh, north, northwest China, yeah, that's one of the languages, Khotanese, you've probably never heard of these languages before, Sogdian, these are Central Asian languages, and suttas exist to the present day in those, in those particular languages, it was quite interesting, yeah. and when you compare them, lo and behold, they are the same suttas. Small differences, of course, because that's what you can expect, you know, with changes happening over 2,300 years. But in essence, the essence of the teachings is basically exactly the same. Thing. So this is how you find out about, you know, uh, these things, how you actually go back and find out what are the root teachings of the Buddha. Those teachings that exist in common across these vast uh, geographical and time scales these teachings are basically the most likely to be the common source of the Buddhist teachings. So. And uh, so to make a long story short, because the story is very long of course, uh, and I don't even know the whole story, there's no fragments, nobody knows the whole story, that's the reality of it. Uh, but to make a sale, to say it in brief, uh, uh, essentially if you want to know what the teachings of the Buddha are, the four Nikayas found in the Pali Canon are very close. Uh, the equivalent Agamas find in Chinese, uh, equivalent suttas find in the Tibetan tradition, uh, that is the core, that is the essence uh, of what the Buddha's teachings are. Why? Because they exist in all the various traditions. Uh. So this is how you start out your monastic life. Yes, the first 15 years all you do is study these various texts, you know, you really mess up your head badly, meditation, you throw it out the window because you want to find out what the teachings of the Buddha are, first of all. You think that's true? Huh? It's a little bit true. Yeah? If you study too much, uh, sometimes you kind of end up going too far. There's always this balance in monastic life between study and practice. So. Uh, but uh, very interesting. And all of this ended up with uh, a book that I published with a very good friend of mine uh, called Ajahn Sujata. Have you heard about Ajahn Sujata? Some of you have heard about Ajahn Sujata. Yeah? He's also quite a prolific scholar, has written many books on Buddhism. Uh, and we published a book together called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Texts. Uh, so if you have read that one, uh, have read it? No? Yes, you have read it. Okay, Richard has read it. Okay, right. Uh, so if you're interested in these things, look up, go online, uh, look up the authenticity of the early Buddhist text. Uh, you can look at my name. Yeah, my name is Brahm, like an Ajahn Brahm. Muslim Ali on the end. Brahm <laughs> Ali. Easy to remember, right? Uh, and then you have Ajahn Sujato. Yeah, so the two, two, two come right together. So look it up. It was published, just I have to brag a little bit, it was published by the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies. Uh, in which Richard Gombrich is kind of the lead, uh, the lead kind of uh, the head man, if you like, of that group in here. So it has a fairly, you know, fairly good, uh, uh, if you like, reference because of, because of that. Uh. But anyway, so now once we have established what the suttas are, what does this mean as far as kamma is concerned? Uh, if we go back to this idea that, uh, uh, you know, all the people in this little village were all kind of wiped out by the tsunami, uh, how can we explain this in a rational way? Does it really make sense to look at this as kamba? And uh, I say no. And this starts out with one thing. One of the first things uh, you can see in the suttas. Yeah, I actually see a lot of things uh, from the very start. But one of the things that is very obvious, uh, one of the things the Buddha says, that everything we experienced uh, is not caused by actions in the past. Uh, if everything we experience is caused by actions of the past, uh, that means that kamma is everything. Yeah? Kamma is not everything here. Yeah? 
which means that many of the things that people experience in their ordinary lives, yeah, you experience, you know, I don't know, maybe you lose your job or you, 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 someone in your family dies or they get very sick or all of these kind of traumas that we have to go through in life, which is part and parcel of life. Uh, a lot of that has got nothing to do with karma. It has to do with basically the circumstances. You're reborn as a human. What do you expect? If you're born as a human, this is what you can expect. Yeah? This is what actually it means. Uh, so everything is not based on karma. This is one of the things the Buddha says. It actually says that if it was that way, the uh, spiritual life would not be possible as a consequence of that, uh, because things would already be locked in. There would be like a fate, uh, in a sense, uh, locked in by past conditions. Uh, and there would be no way of getting out of that. Uh. So this is the, one of the first things that you realize when you read the suttas. And that already is very useful. One of the things that happen to you as a Buddhist monk, yeah? yeah? These are some of the secrets of monastic life. Do you know the secrets of monastic life? I'll tell you some of the secrets of monastic life, yeah? <laughs> so this is just to make it a bit more interesting here. Yeah? So one of the uh, things that happened, it's actually not the secret at all, I'm just messing around. So the, one of the things that happened to you as a Buddhist monk, people always ask you for advice, uh, yeah? Especially if you are from a traditional Buddhist country, uh, the people who used to advise people in traditional Buddhist countries were the monastics. Uh, the monastics were the psychologists, they were the doctors, they were the teachers. And they had a very broad range of responsibilities in traditional Asian societies, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, in Burma, yeah, and probably all over the Buddhist world. Uh, so because of that, it's very common. It happens with, with people from the Western background as well, uh, but more so with people from a traditional Buddhist background. Uh, and they come to the monks and they ask you about their problems. Uh, yeah? I, my wife has just left me. My husband is cheating on me. What should I do? What, have I, what did I do in the past to deserve this? Yeah, this is kind of the standard question you get. In other words, they want to know what karma they did in the past so that they, you know, their wife has left them or they, uh, someone has died in the family or they got fired from the job or whatever. What karma did I do to avoid to actually get into this difficult situation? And uh, you can see why people ask these questions. People want to have some kind of closure. Uh, they want to have a sense that they understand the universe, the laws and mechanisms uh, that drive uh, your life. They want to have some sense that they actually understand that. Uh, and of course, part of this is this idea that if we understand the laws uh, that govern nature, govern, uh, you know, govern our humanity or whatever it is, uh, if you understand that, then we can actually avoid uh, doing the same things in the future. Yeah. So they come to the bomb, please tell me, what did I do in the past? Read my mind for goodness sake. Now I want to know what I did in the past so that I can avoid doing this in the future. Yeah. But actually, it is a complete waste of time. Yeah? It is not the right way of thinking about the Dhamma. Because for, for the first point, of course, is very simply that uh, very often it has nothing to do with what we did in the past. Uh, you got reborn as a human being, uh, and when you're reborn as a human being, that's it. Tough luck, you are kind of stuck with it. Uh, now you're going to have to deal with the consequences. And the consequence of that is, unfortunately, a fair amount of pain in our lives. Yeah? Life actually entails a fair amount of suffering. And it's impossible to avoid that, basically. Unless you become an Arahant, yeah? or a Buddha, or something like that. That's always a way out. Uh, that takes quite a bit of dedication and, and perseverance. But that's, that, of course, is a possibility. Yeah. So, um, it is the wrong way of thinking about karma to try to look for the cause somewhere in the past so that then you can try to control nature in such a way, control <coughs> yourself in such a way, not to recreate those causes in the future. That's kind of the idea, yeah? But the problem is that life is so complicated there. There are so many causes of karma. You cannot just avoid certain things and thereby ensure that you have a good life in the future. It doesn't work like that because it's so complex. There are so many causes. There are so many things coming together. And that makes it very hard to, uh, it makes it possible basically to, to do that. Uh, so instead, what we should do when something bad happens in our life uh, is to understand that this is the nature of existence. Uh, life is like this. Uh, that is basically the lesson in these things. Uh, and when you understand that life is like this, uh, it starts to change your priorities a little bit. Uh, you start to think about existence in a new way. Uh, if you think that something has gone wrong, uh, you will look for the solution. Uh, if you understand that nothing has actually gone wrong, this is the nature of life, uh, you don't look for the solution in the same place. You look for solutions somewhere else. Uh, and that somewhere else, of course, is the spiritual path and the spiritual practice that gradually elevates you, lifts you up, uh, and lifts you out of the quagmire of existence. Uh, and that is the right attitude when something goes wrong. Don't ask 
uh, why this happened. Ask yourself, what do I need to do now in order to make more spiritual progress uh, to reduce these kind of problems globally, not singly, but globally in the future? Yeah. So this is the first lesson. Yeah, it may seem very obvious, uh, but actually it is a very important part of this uh, a whole outlook, understanding the ideas of karma in particular. Yeah. One of the other things that became very clear to me, of course, when I started reading the suttas, is that if the Buddha says that uh, all we experience in life is not caused by actions in the past, uh, it must mean that there are other causes for what we experience, yeah, apart from karma of the past. Uh. And the Buddha says, indeed, he has a long list in a number of suttas, I think eight different things, uh, only one of those is karma, actions from the past. Uh, and the other things is actually a very interesting list. One of the things that he talks about is illness. Yeah, illness happens because of all kinds of causes and conditions, <coughs> but he, it's separated out. It is not actually included in karma from the past. There may very well be some illnesses that, that are caused by karma, but there are other, other illnesses that are not caused by karma. Yeah, this is what he's saying here. The other, one of the other ones he has in there is assault. Yeah, assault sometimes happens not because of karma, but it happens because of circumstances. You walk down the wrong street, the wrong street at the wrong time of the night. Does that happen in London? Yeah, the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, and some bad, someone who's not a really good Buddhist, yeah, they come up and they <laughs> give you a hard time because of, because of whatever reason. And so you get assaulted, and this happens. And the Buddha says, this is not necessarily, also not necessarily due to karma from the past. Another one, he says, is careless actions. You are careless, you're not being mindful, you're not being circumspect, you're not being heedful about what you're doing. You're stepping in the wrong place, you're kind of walking down the street, you forget to look to the left. Are you in England now? Is it left or right? You're supposed to look to <laughs> left first and then, no, I, I get very confused because I move around so many different countries sometimes. Uh, if that was one of the really, no, I'm not going to go there. That's it. <laughs> Let's leave that one out. Uh, so uh, you walk into the street, because you're in England, and usually I, was, I grew up in Norway, partly, I also grew up in England, I grew up in France, I grew up in Germany, now I live in Australia, it's actually, I'm actually nothing, I'm kind of confused, that's what I really am. Uh, but, uh, so when you come to England, you have to be careful, look to the, you know, in the right, whether it's left or right first, otherwise the car will run you down. Uh, yeah? That is basically uh, an act of heedlessness, of being careless. Uh. So all of these things are said to be alternative causes for why we experience the world that we do, why we have, ple why we have pleasure, why we have suffering, and why we also sometimes have the neutral feeling in between. And of course, all of these things, assault, careless actions and illnesses, part of that is dying. Yeah? So death can obviously happen as a consequence of a very serious assault. Death can happen as a consequence of illness. It can happen as a cons consequence of being careless. Yeah, and that is when you start to understand why all of these people. And another one is the weather. Yeah, is another one. The weather is also sub you know so things like climate change maybe can be kind of subsumed just for uh, just for kind of practical purpose. Even though it is a different phenomenon, it can maybe be subsumed under weather for these particular purposes. Maybe the tsunami also can be kind of regarded as the weather in a more kind of large scale, perhaps. Yeah. And now you start to see the outline of a solution to this problem. You were in Archer province in the wrong place at the wrong time. The weather turned really bad. In fact, so bad, the whole place got flooded by a massive wave. That's really, really bad weather for you. <laughs> and even worse than England. You may think you have a lot of rain in England, but that's nothing compared to these tsunamis. And then, of course, you start to see the outline of why people can die without actually being come up from the past but being other causes and conditions for the dying. It is simply about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And for that reason, then, uh, you, you know, this is what happens to you here. So, uh, as you start to read the suttas more broadly, and you start to see these kind of, uh, 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 how these things work, you start to get a different view of how karma operates. Uh, one of the other things that also is very interesting is one, uh, quite well-known sutta in the Majjhima Nikai, the middle length sayings of the Buddha. It's called the uh, Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, which is the uh, exposition, the shorter exposition on Kama, uh, yeah, found in the suttas. Uh, and uh, the shorter exposition of Kama, this particular sutta, is translated into more language than any other sutta in the, uh, that exists in the Buddhist canon. It exists in 15 different languages, something like that. It's really, really vast. And because the reason for that is because it contains a fairly popular topic. It talks about 
actions and the effects, yeah, karma and the effects of karma. And in that sutta, <coughs> okay, good. In that sutta, uh, one of the things it says there is that it says that the karmic consequence of killing living beings is that you have short life yourself. Yeah. In other words, you die at a certain point before uh, you otherwise would die if your karma hadn't been so bad. And uh, so, but notice the causality here. The causality is from from doing something bad, from killing living beings, that results in short life. Yeah. Normally, this is understood to mean that if you have a short life, it meant that you killed beings in the past. But that is not the same thing. Can you see the distinction there? The, for, the causality is forward from the bad actions of killing to having short life. It is not backwards in the fact that because you have a short life, therefore you must have killed living beings in the past. There are many causes for short life. One of them is the fact that you have killed living beings in the past. But there are other also uh, causes as well, like being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, so sometimes you have to read these suttas very carefully. Uh, yeah? And of course that helps a lot if you know a bit of Pali and these kind of things. And I, I enjoy myself <coughs> sometimes translating a little bit of suttas. Uh, and when you get into the original language, sometimes it's easier to not add some of the tricky problems of the, you know, what actually is meant in the, uh, uh, by the Pali uh, before it's translated into English. Uh. So you can see again, you have to be, read the suttas, you have to know what is there, what comes from the Buddha, and you have to read them carefully to draw out the essence of the information in there. So uh, uh, this is, uh, these are just some ways to kind of uh, uh, look at karma, which is kind of uncommon, uh, which is not the way people normally think about karma, uh, but I think very useful to make sense of the world in a way that is, in my opinion, more uh, uh, more sensible, uh, yeah, it makes better sense, uh, it fits better with kind of our modern outlook and how things work, uh, and also it turns out actually to be the word of the Buddha, it's just that our modern ways of thinking about these things are not in accordance with how the Buddha taught these things. Uh. So uh, that is the, uh, the first aspect of karma that I want to talk about. Uh. Is this uh, interesting? Uh, I, yeah, it's all right, yeah? Okay, good, uh, yeah. If I see people yawning at the back, uh, yeah? This kind of, I don't really want to see that because it puts me awfully busy. Kind of, you know, kind of yawning. <laughs> I'm being very, I apologize, I'm being silly here. So, um, uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk about very briefly is uh, the idea of how we can use the idea of karma in a practical way. Um, and uh, Usually, the way that karma is talked about, it is talked about that the actions that you do in this life will affect your future lives. Yeah? Usually, you're told, yeah, do lots of good things in this life, you have a nice rebirth in your next life. That is the standard way that karma is taught in the, uh, you know, across around the world, almost everywhere. Yeah? But if you go back to the suttas again, the Buddha says there is three types of ripening of karma. The first one is the ripening in the next life of actions that you do now. Yeah? The second one is the ripening in lives beyond your next life. Uh, but the first one, and the most interesting one in my opinion, uh, is actions that you do in this life uh, and actually ripen in this very life. Uh, yeah? Because this is something that obviously we can have some insight into, something we can see for ourselves. Uh, and I really recommend you to investigate this one, because this one can become, if you do it skillfully and you do it wisely, it can become a very powerful source for uh, living well, living a life you know, with more kindness and compassion in the world, uh, with more serenity and all these positive things, uh, uh, it can become a very powerful source for that and the motivation to live much better. Uh, and uh, the basic idea, the way I understand this particular type of karma is that you can actually experience it, it right here in the present moment. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and if you, uh, I, just a very brief thought experiment, and I say this to people everywhere because it's actually, I think it is very useful. Usually I like to talk about practical things in Buddhism, and this is one of those very practical things. Uh, so just uh, very briefly, if you do an act of kindness to somebody, yeah, if you feel suddenly one day, you feel just so generous, uh, you feel like your heart opens up to the world, uh, you want to give something to other people, you just want to say something kind to someone, you want to do an act of uh, charity or whatever it is, and it's coming from something very beautiful inside of you, and then you do that, uh, how do you feel about yourself when that happens? Uh? Do you feel good about yourself? Uh? Yeah? Anyone who feels bad about themselves when that happens? Uh? Nobody feels bad about themselves. Yeah, I know what it feels like. Uh, 
when I feel, sometimes you feel this overwhelming urge almost to do something kind, to do something beautiful. It's as if something opens up inside of you and you just want to be kind to the world around you. And when you do that, coming from the right motivation in this way, you feel so happy afterwards. You feel good about yourself. It's not that you get a big ego, yeah, yeah, I am really good, yeah, these scallywags, they are really dodgy, but I know what I'm doing, yeah, I, there's a big difference between me and them. That's not what it feels like at all. It's not nothing to do with ego or with selfishness in that way. It is more like a sense of peaceful, quiet satisfaction with how you live your life, yeah? You close your eyes and you feel inside of yourself and you feel good about yourself because you know that you are living well there. This is what I mean when I talk about when the Buddha talks about karma right here in the present life, this is what I understand. You can experience it right here and right now. And this is extraordinarily useful because it is a guide, basically a guide uh, to every action that you do. What follows from every action what, that you do? Do you feel good after the action? Do you feel bad? Do you feel neutral? That straight away tells you something about the motivation and the intention that lies behind these actions. Take the other side of the coin. If you do something which isn't quite nice, yeah, something which is a little bit nasty or negative, you say something bad, yeah, you kind of got out on the wrong side of the bed in the morning, you're feeling a bit negative and grumpy, yeah, you say something and you know after, I shouldn't have said that, that was a mistake, why did I say that? You know it wasn't the right thing to do, yeah? You feel, a bit, uh, you feel your energy levels go down, yeah? You feel like the brightness of the mind drops a little bit uh, and you find yourself regretting your action a little bit afterwards. Uh, and that is how you experience negative karma right here, right now, in the present life. Uh, so you can see what is going on here. If you live a life of purity, if you live a life of generosity and kindness to the people around you, if you meditate, if you move towards peace, if you move towards a heart which is more bright and beautiful, you're building up all these positive moments, yeah, one after the other one. Your mind is becoming lighter, more bright, more beautiful as a consequence of this. At the same time, you avoid the bad ones that drag you down, all the sandbags that hold you down, that keep the balloon of the mind from soaring into the air. You cut those sandbags off. Yeah, you know, I, whatever, yeah, I'm not sure how to do this, but something like that. You kind of untether the, the, the balloon or whatever, and then it soars up. And you can feel that in your life, right here, right now, if you are consistent with being moral, with being kind, with being generous, and avoiding the bad things, that is exactly what you experience. Uh, and I know this as a personal experience. Yeah? I'm very <coughs> glad that I didn't meet any of you here 25 years ago. Uh, why is that? Because 25 years is a long time. A lot happens. Uh, you might have seen me 25 years ago and you would have said, that fellow there, he is a no-hoper. Yeah? There's no chance that he will do anything good in life. Uh, he is kind of, he is doomed. He is kind of, uh, he's gonna, whatever. If he becomes a monk, he will be a total failure or whatever. Uh, but uh, that isn't what happened. Uh, what actually happens, if you are sincere about the practice, uh, something starts to happen inside of you. Uh, you do become more bright. Uh, you do become more happy. The suffering in life starts to go down. Uh, there is a change going on inside. Uh, and the honest truth is that the one thing that has sustained me in my monastic life uh, is this feeling of being on an incline uh, that is moving upwards and upwards and upwards. Uh, it is, you know, heading really, really high, yeah? And sometimes you kind of get a glimpse of the heights of what this is going to. And it's very, very powerful when you see that happening inside of you. And this is what <laughs> each one of you, if you are serious about the Buddhist practice, uh, what each one of you should be aiming for, the sense that something inside of you is changing. Uh, you look back from one year to the next one, and you can see there is a difference in your mindfulness. Uh, there is a difference in the degree of kindness inside of you. Uh, there's a difference in your generosity. Uh, your abilities of focusing on the breath, on the meditation retreat are better than they were before. All these good qualities are gradually improving. Uh, and if they are, then you know you're practicing the Buddhist path in the right way. If they are not, uh, you need to ask yourself some really tough questions. Uh, why isn't it happening? If you ask the right questions, uh, you can resolve the issues and you can be back again on that track which brings you upwards uh, and going upwards. Uh, yeah, you don't really know where it ends. Uh, they say it's Nibbana, but anyway, it's a very exciting journey, a very interesting journey that you're on right there, right then. Uh. So use the idea of Kamma in this way. And if you use it in this way, you have a very powerful tool to motivate you in your practice. Uh, if you see through direct experience that uh, 
kind actions actually bring you happiness. Uh, bad actions bring you suffering here. And you see the connection between your intention and how you feel about yourself directly in the present moment. It becomes extraordinarily powerful. You become fearful of doing the wrong thing, yeah? Because you know that the only person you're dragging down is yourself. Uh, you're kind of, uh, you know, asking for torture in a sense. Uh, dragging yourself down, making your own life more miserable. Uh, yeah, and of course, when you see that, you understand the power of these things, the power of intention to uh, drive us in the right direction and, and he head in the right way. Yeah. So, uh, how long can I, should I speak for? Uh, is there any kind of, uh, yeah? Another 20 minutes. Another 20 minutes? Uh, okay. If you, if you feel like you know, no, I no, I've only talked about Kama. What about rebirth? Kama and rebirth, yeah. <laughs> so, gonna, uh, so we have to we have to carry on a little bit. Uh. So, but I'm going to leave Kama aside for there. If, if for those of you who are interested, a few years ago uh, we did an online course on Kama and rebirth in early Buddhism. It's available online. I did it with again my friend Adan Sujato. So if you're interested <coughs> in kind of the bus um, uh, busting some of the myths in uh, uh, in traditional Buddhism about these things, you can check it out online. Uh. And you can see if it, is, uh, if it uh, makes any sense to you. Uh, but let's come to rebirth, because rebirth, in many ways, is even more essential, more fundamental to understand uh, than the idea of karma. Actually, the two go together. They go hand in hand. It's only when they go hand in hand that actually uh, these things become very powerful. Uh, and why do I say that rebirth is so powerful? And one of the reasons why it is so important, yeah, and this is really the first starting point, whether you believe in rebirth or not is a secondary matter, but the starting point is to find out what did the Buddha say about this? That is always what I go back to. Huh? So when you uh, read uh, the suttas, the early discourse I was talking about before, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, you read these things and you start, after a while you start to realize that if there, there are a few things we can almost be absolutely certain the Buddha must have taught. Uh, and the reason we can be certain about that is because it is found everywhere. We can be absolutely sure that the Buddha taught morality. Yeah? There's no doubt about that. We can be absolutely sure he taught meditation practice because it's found everywhere in the suttas. We can be sure he taught rebirth because that too is found everywhere in the suttas. If there's anything we can say anything about, it is rebirth. Yeah? Just as important as sila, as morality, as meditation and many of these other things. That is how important it is. It is everywhere across the suttas, found in all kinds of different contexts. When the Buddha says that somebody has become awake and has become an arahant uh, and reached the end of the path, uh, what does that person know? Uh, yeah, well, they know that I finished the path. Yeah, but it doesn't say all that much. Done is what should be done. Uh, Katan Kadaniyang, that doesn't say that much. The one thing that they know, the one insight the arahant has is what? Uh, they have made an end of rebirth. Uh, and that is expressed in different ways. Uh, if you take away rebirth, uh, what you are doing, you're taking away the very end point of what awakening is in the Buddhist teachings. You have to rephrase it completely, recreate Buddhism in your own mind. And this is why if you read some of the books, I'm not going to mention any names, but if you read some of the books of some of the modern teachers, that's what they do. They take at rebirth and think, cheapest. okay, rebirth isn't here. What does that mean? It means that we have to change this, we have to change that, awakening becomes something else. Yeah, the idea of dependent origination becomes different. Yeah. Everything becomes different because you take out one of the central pillars of the right view that supports the whole edifice of Buddhism. You take that out, the whole things come crumbling down. And what you have to do is rewrite Buddhism from scratch. And if you read some of those books, that's essentially what they're doing. They're rewriting Buddhism from scratch. So what are we going to do? Are we going to kind of listen to some of these modern interpreters? Or are we going to go back to the word of the Buddha and see what the Buddha had to say about these things? I say, let's at least look at what the Buddha had to say about this. Uh, so, uh, as an example, one of the things that people are not, of, not aware of uh, is that rebirth is found in each one of the four noble truths. Uh, yeah, first noble truth is a noble truth of suffering. Uh, uh, the noble truth of suffering is defined as starting off, first of all, birth is suffering. Yeah, then you have all day is suffering, illness is suffering. Uh, death is suffering, being separated from what you like is suffering, being united with it, what you don't like is suffering, uh, and then ultimately the five aggregates, that's a terrible word, uh, the five factors of personality, yeah, the five khandas uh, are subject, uh, um, subject to grasping, to clinging, to taking up, uh, these are what suffering are, is in brief. Uh. But you will notice that the very first one is birth. Uh. 
Yeah, so what does that mean? And now you have to be very careful. That, so suffering is the thing that we are supposed to eliminate in Buddhism. So if birth is suffering, it cannot mean the birth that we've already had, because that's already finished. We can't eliminate the birth we've already been through. So it cannot refer to the birth in this life, nor can it refer to birth in past lives. The only birth that this can refer to is birth in future lives. So right there at the very beginning of the Four Noble Truths, birth is suffering actually is a reference to rebirth. It has to be, because that is the only suffering you can eliminate as far as birth is concerned. Yeah, so this is already quite interesting, isn't it? It took me 20 years to figure this out. <laughs> I was reading it again and I thought, wait a minute, okay, this must mean something else. This is how long it takes sometimes, because you actually have to reflect on these things, to draw out the meaning of these things. That is noble truth number one. The second noble truth is much more easy, because the second noble truth says that the cause of suffering is craving, tanha in the Pali language, and that tanha is qualified as the pono bhavika tanha. Pono bhavika means re-existence, it means rebirth. Yeah? So it is the craving that leads to rebirth, is the craving that actually is talked about in the second noble truth. So rebirth again. Third noble truth says that the ending of suffering is the removal of that very craving that is found in the second noble truth. So it refers back to the second noble truth. So that too must refer to rebirth. And of course, the fourth noble truth is about the Noble Eightfold Path. What does the Noble Eightfold Path start with? Right view. Right view is either the four noble truths, I've just proven to you that that uh, includes rebirth, or it is what they call ordinary uh, right view, which is the idea that there is rebirth, there is come and all these kind of things. That too has rebirth in it. All four noble truths have rebirth in them. Yeah. This is like the summary, this is the overall map of what the Buddhist teaching is about. Uh, Venerable Sariputta says in the Maha Hatipadopa Masutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 28, the, simile, the great assembly of the elephant's footprint, uh, he says in there that uh, uh, the Four Noble Truth is the all-encompassing framework for the entire Dhamma. That is full of rebirth right there. Yeah, so do you think it's important or what? Uh, yeah, just a little bit important, yeah, just marginally important perhaps. Uh, I'm being naughty now, I apologize, but I <laughs> that's how it seems to me. And uh, then of course you have things like dependent origination, uh, dependent origination, the 11th link or the 11th factor of dependent origination, again is birth, uh, always defined as rebirth uh, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, wherever it is defined in the suttas, uh, that too is about rebirth. Uh, yeah? And on and on it goes like that. Right view itself is about, obviously, part and parcel of that is rebirth and karma and all of these kind of things. Uh. So I'm just giving you some ideas about uh, the, how fundamental it is to the Buddhist teachings. Take it out. You're removing one of the fundamental pillars of Buddhism. Everything's come crashing down. Nothing is left. You have to resurrect it from ground up. Yeah? And you get, of course, an entirely new teaching. Yeah, and you could, can't really call it Buddhism anymore because it isn't really recognizable. It's something else. I don't know what it is, uh, but it's certainly something else. Uh. So, uh, one of the things that was suggested I should talk a little bit about is uh, how this fits with modern ideas. Are we, is it possible in our modern world, are we allowed to take the idea of rebirth seriously? Very often you hear the argument that, you know, according to modern science, the a world is basically they have, you know, have the philosophy of physicalism or materialism that the entire world is basically built up of physical components acting together through the laws of nature and that there is no room there for the mind or for consciousness. Consciousness is like a byproduct of material phenomena. And of course if that is the case then rebirth becomes impossible. Uh, but what is interesting if you start to read some of the literature uh, about uh, um, you know, some of the things that have been coming out very recently from, uh, not only from kind of alternative science, but also from mainstream science, uh, there is a greater and greater acceptance uh, for bringing consciousness back into science again. Uh, and it's happening uh, among some of the great researchers in neuroscience, for example, around the world. Uh, they have started to take the idea that consciousness uh, is a fundamental building block of the world, uh, has started to be taken seriously again. Uh, of course, there are many of you will have heard about some very, you know, the interesting research done by people like Professor Ian Stevenson. Have you heard of Professor Ian Stevenson? Yeah, the very famous Canadian 
a doctor who did all the research on children remembering past lives. Uh, and there's some very interesting research there, uh, especially about you know, uh, people who are born with, kind of with amputated limbs and these kind of things, uh, and then have memories about how that happened. And then finding the people who actually uh, w you know, who, who match that kind of description. It's very interesting. Yeah. You have things like near-death experiences, out-of-body experience, all of that. There's a lot of research in those areas. Uh, then I thought, instead of looking at that, I'll talk about a couple of other areas, which to me also is very fascinating. Yeah. And one of these uh, areas, and this uh, is something I read in a book, which you might, if you are interested in this area, is a book called Irreducible Mind. Yeah, the idea of the title Irreducible Mind is that the mind is not reducible to material phenomena. And for that reason, the book is called Irreducible Mind. So, one of the things that the authors were saying in there, which apparently <coughs> one of the things that is quite well known in the medical world, uh, is that for a large number of Alzheimer's patients, uh, yeah, when you are very demented towards the very end of your life, uh, you may not have remembered your relatives for a decade or two, yeah, you have no idea who your children are or who your friends are, anything like that. Uh, apparently it's quite a common phenomenon. Uh, at the very end, after having forgotten everyone, everyone and everything for a decade, very last 10, 15, 20 minutes of your life, you regain clarity again. Uh, yeah? You recognize your children and you can have a conversation with your family members just as you are passing away. Uh, yeah? And from a modern medical point of view, it's impossible because your brain is completely damaged. There's no kind of way that the brain is able to operate in this, this way anymore. Uh, but from a Buddhist idea, the Buddhist idea, of course, is that in the dying process, uh, what is happening is that your mind is starting to separate from your ordinary physical body and because it is separating from the ordinary physical body those constraints of the brain that uh, uh, stop you from being able to talk to people around you, from recognizing them, those constraints are removed uh, because they are removed, you are able to function normally again. Uh, yeah, so from the idea of mind being a uh, not being completely tied up with the ordinary physical body, it actually makes very good sense. Uh, be, be careful here, because one of the things that I'm always concerned about is that people think that this is kind of back to the ancient uh, uh, philosophical ideas, the Descartian ideas of duality, where you have mind on the one hand and matter on the other hand, and you have two substances that can't really mix with each other. But this is not really what this is about, uh, because even mind in Buddhism, even if you separate from the physical body, there are still material phenomena connected with that mind but of a different nature. Uh, yeah? So it's not really the same as what is known in philosophy as Descartian dualism. It's not really about that at all. It's a much more involved uh, philosophy uh, from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, anyway, it's just a still small little side issue. Uh. This is one of these little things that we see in modern, uh, in modern science has been kind of, which is very interesting and very hard to explain. So if you trust those anecdotes, uh, and I think sometimes we really should trust some of these anecdotes, uh, especially if a large number of doctors uh, can confirm this, uh, we should actually take this thing seriously. Uh. Another one which is very interesting, and that has to do with uh, drug usage. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the um, uh, you know, back in the 1960s when people started to take LSD and these kind of things, one of the most uh, uh, interesting and kind of mind, they call it mind expanding, I'm not sure if mind expanding is the right <coughs> term, uh, but one of the properties of LSD is that you have this enormous changed perception of reality. Yeah, I have never taken it. I'm just being upfront about it. Uh, but I know a lot of people have taken LSD. And let's say it really changes your outlook. It changes the world in a different way. You see things that you've never seen before. It kind of opens up your mind. The sense of self starts to disappear. All of these marvelous and wonderful things. Uh, and for a lot of people, it actually is a driving force onto the spiritual path. Uh, because you know that an alternative reality is possible. Uh, but what is uh, interesting, in very recent times, they've started to do experiments again with people on LSD. Yeah? So they get a volunteer, do you take, like to take LSD? Okay, yeah, so to pop this tablet, yeah? and, then we'll, and then once they pop the tablet, you whack them into the MRI scanner. Yeah? Okay, into the MRI scanner you go. Uh, and then while you're in the MRI scanner, we want to running commentary on what you are experiencing on, on LSD. So they're sitting in there, I don't know if they have the microphone or what, uh, 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 in the MRI scanner giving a running commentary and while they're doing that, the MRI is scanning their brain. Imagine the situation, pretty, pretty kind, of <laughs> kind of remarkable. And what they find is that as they have the most intense experiences uh, during the LSD trip, uh, yeah, really, really intense experiences, uh, the brain activity is at its lowest. Uh, 
So it is an opposite correlation between the brain activity and the experience that you're having. And again, it goes against all scientific theory. So according to all scientific theory, if you experience a lot, there should also be a lot of brain activity. Actually, there's an inverse correlation, it seems, between your experienced reality, uh, in terms of how vivid it is and how much you're experiencing, and the amount of brain activity. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Would you like to, anyone like to volunteer for this experiment, sir? Yeah, a bit of LSD would be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, actually I should, this is terrible. I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm supposed not to tell these kind of things at all. <laughs> so don't do LSD. Forget what I just said now. It's a bad thing to do. It's not really, usually very helpful. Usually what happens is that people who do LSD, it doesn't take long before they realize it's very limited uh, what these things can do for you. Uh, and really, the real experience are to be had in meditation practice. Yeah? I want to make that absolutely clear. <laughs> far more interesting, far more powerful in meditation than on LSD. They all actually say that. Actually, I'm not lying about that at all. Uh, so, uh, especially for those of you who live in countries where taking drugs is really kind of serious, please don't do that. Uh, anyway, so that is, uh, uh, that is the idea, again, a, a kind of nice little uh, <coughs> modern experiment that shows you, again, the possibility that mind and matter actually often are two fairly separate phenomena. Uh, the third thing that is very interesting is something that you see now more and more in physics, uh, yeah, the idea of quantum physics. I am no expert in this, I'm not, I can only give you a very superficial view, but what we seem to know more and more, and the more and more experiments that seem to be confirming this, uh, that consciousness is necessary for uh, the quantum phenomena to, you know, for, uh, you know, you have the fa famous Schrodinger's cat uh, thing here, consciousness is actually necessary as part of the thing that the, to collapse the uh, Schrodinger wave equation, whatever that means, uh, yeah? So to have an outcome for things to happen according to quantum mechanics, you have to have consciousness. Uh. And one of the interesting things, and you probably nobody here knows about this, uh, uh, back in 2005 there was a leading leader article in Nature magazine. Nature magazine is the number one scientific article in the world. There's one in the US called Science which also is very good, but I think Nature is probably still the number one when it comes to you know, authority and all these kind of things. Uh, it had a lead article by a physicist at John Hopkins University in the US, one of the top universities in the US. Uh, and in this lead article, this physicist says, uh, it is time that we accepted that the world is mental. <laughs> yeah, the world is mental, that's what he said. He's a physicist, he's a hard-nosed scientist. This was a lead article in Nature magazine, the world <coughs> is mental. Uh, and this happened in 2005, and since then, uh, uh, this is what they say, I'm no expert again, since then uh, experiments have only strengthened that idea that the world is mental. Consciousness is a fundamental aspect of reality without which reality actually couldn't even exist uh, because the Schrodinger wave e equation needs to collapse for, ph for phenomena to manifest. Uh, yeah? So a fundamental aspect of existence uh, is consciousness according to modern physics. Uh, yeah, so very exciting times. And so what you are seeing now, gradually the physicists are starting to come out of the closet, yeah, they've been very careful, they're very afraid of saying things that might get them kicked out of the good company of the fellow physicists, but gradually there is a change happening. Neuroscientists, yeah, who understand that actually uh, we're not able to explain the mind fully based on physical phenomena in the brain alone. Uh, there's a very famous American uh, neuroscientist called Christoph Koch, and he basically is one of the people who has interest in the idea called panpsychism. And panpsychism is the idea that consciousness is one of the fundamental aspects of reality, just as matter and the forces of nature are there. I'm not saying panpsychism is the right way of looking at reality, but I'm saying that there is a change, there is a, what we call a paradigm shift yeah, happening in science. People are moving from the old paradigm of leaving consciousness out and now bringing it in into mainstream science and soon it will be i think part of our mainstream discourse part of our mainstream outlook that consciousness is a part of reality a part of what uh, uh, how the world is built up uh, and fundamentally you know when you think about it it's actually blooming obvious isn't it uh, what is the first thing that we can say about reality is that we have experience yeah if there's anything you can say about reality is that we experience stuff uh, there's nothing more fundamental than that and then from that is what we derive all the forces of nature, all the laws of nature that are derived from our primary experience, which is an experience of the world. What is this experience? Well, uh, you know, 
obviously a fundamental part of experience is consciousness itself, the ability to be aware, the ability to uh, take in the data, if you like. Yeah. So actually, it is so obvious, uh, and it's just so uh, and remarkable that it's taken science so long to gradually come around to this. Uh, and it shows you that danger, you know, sure science has many powerful tools, uh, but it also shows you a little bit about the limits sometimes of the scientific uh, approach, uh, because sometimes you get trapped in paradigms, uh, and it's very hard to break out of those paradigms. Uh, there's a very famous book by a, uh, uh, a philosopher of science, uh, he was an American as well, uh, his name was Cohen, uh, Thomas Cohen, something like that, uh, who wrote a book called The uh, the structure of scientific revolutions, where he talked about this idea of paradigms, how people get locked into a certain paradigm. And then you have to kind of build up, accumulate the evidence, accumulate the evidence, and you break out of the paradigm, and a new paradigm gets established. And what that means is that science tends to be conservative. It tends to be locked into certain worldviews. Yeah? And it may be right in many areas, but it also has certain limitations. So that is important to keep in mind. There. So this is uh, some of the evidence. Now the Final piece of evidence, uh, and this is the most important one. Yeah, uh, this is really the powerful one for me here. Uh, and what is that? Uh, and that is what I will call the anecdotal evidence. The anecdotal evidence from the suttas. Uh, when you have read the suttas for long enough, uh, and you are convinced that the Buddha had something very, very powerful to say to the world, uh, that he had a very good understanding of human psyche, uh, he understands humanity across time, across cultures, uh, we are two and a half thousand years removed from the time of the Buddha in a very different culture. In the end, he speaks to us almost as if it is directly to our hearts. Uh, there's something extraordinarily powerful about these teachings when you start to read them. Uh, once you start to build up confidence in the Buddha, and the Buddha says to you without kind of blinking an eye, he says to you straight in the face, there is rebirth. I have seen that there is rebirth. How can I not take it seriously? Uh, yeah, this to me is what I would call anecdotal evidence of the highest order here. Someone you have a lot of confidence in, someone you know is a historical personality, someone whose teaching is still available to us, uh, said this. Uh, then you are almost forced, in my opinion, to take it seriously. That to me is the most powerful evidence of all. It is really only just anecdotal evidence, uh, but still it is extraordinarily powerful be precisely because of the person who said it, uh, because of the authority of that person here. Uh. Anyway, that's just my opinion about that. Uh. So, what does all of this mean? Uh? What is the point? Why am I kind of harping on about rebirth in this way? Yeah, you kind of this this fellow is getting a bit obsessed by this. Uh. Um, and but the point is that this has actually very profound consequences for how we look at the world, how we think about reality, and how we deal. Uh, with our life right here in the present moment. It is not just a matter of something that is, yes, you have a right view, I believe in rebirth, I don't believe in rebirth. It is not as simple as that. Uh, one of the most important things that we need to do as Buddhists uh, is not just to kind of have a right view, but to develop that right view. Okay, so you believe in rebirth. Now, what does it actually mean if there is rebirth? What does it actually mean to you as a person? Does it, you know, what, what are the consequences of this? Well, if I'm going to get reborn again and again and again, yeah. Wait a minute, you know, I already had one life, I'm going to have another one do exactly the same thing. Do I really want to do that? Maybe that's not such a good idea. You start to look at the consequences of what this is, and you start to think about it very carefully, it starts to have a very powerful emotional impact on you. Yeah, so because rebirth, because right view, is the very first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, if that factor is developed to a very high degree and it has a very powerful emotional impact on you, it's going to drive you forward on the Noble Eightfold Path. So the more you grasp, the more you reflect on the idea of right view, rebirth, karma, the idea that there is a Buddha out there, all these kind of things, the more you internalize that, the more you make it real, understand the consequences of that, the more powerful is going to be that right view at the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's going to push you forward and make the path possible. Yeah, that is what it is all about. Right view is not a matter of yay or nay. Yeah, it's not, yay, I believe in karma, rebirth, and the Holy Spirit. It's not like that. Yeah, it is about something much more profound than that. Something about building up something that you develop inside of yourself. And then it becomes a very powerful force in your life. This is what it's really about. Uh, and uh, one way of understanding this, I, I should really stop now because I'm already over time. Uh, and uh, what, what time do I get, do I get kicked out? Uh, is there any kind of uh, point?
point well, which I have not. You've got to leave yeah? some time for, for people to ask questions. Yes, and then certainly. Some people want to go home. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to go home, please, yeah, do not feel shy. I promise not to kind of, you know, blacklist you or anything like that. So I don't know who we are anyway. So please, if you have to go, of course, please feel free to go at any time. Yeah. But um, uh, one of the things that I always found very fascinating about this, and this is one of the beautiful similes of the Buddha, which I'm going to bring back now. This is a simile I talk about all the time. So those of you who have heard me speak before, which is probably some of you, uh, you will think, yeah, yeah, the same old simile. Yeah, but actually, it's a very powerful, in my opinion, very beautiful simile. And this is the simile of the borrowed goods. And this is where the Buddha says that, well, the things in our life, in that we have in the present life, all our belongings, all our relationships, yeah, all our social standing, a lot of the mental content that we have, yeah, our education, whatever it is, even our physical body, all these things that we have built up in the present life, made into something, they are like borrowed goods. Why are they like borrowed goods? Because it's all going to have to disappear. Our belongings disappear sometimes in the middle of life, our house burns down. I live in Australia, house burned down all the time, yeah, and you, you, your home is gone, all the belongings are gone, and it's very traumatic. When all the belongings are gone, actually it's very traumatic for people. Uh, our relationships, the same thing, they often fall apart in this very life. But all of these things, we know at the very least, it's going to, part, it's going to fall apart. It's going to, we're going to have to give it up when we die. Yeah? So everything in our life that belongs to this world, uh, status, uh, our education, our relationship to other people, everything of these things that belong to this world uh, is going to have to go. Uh. So what are the consequences of that? That everything in our life is like borrowed goods. Uh. Well, the consequences of that, you have to ask yourself the question, is there anything that is not borrowed goods? Yeah? I'd rather not have to hand everything back when I die. I'd like to take something with me. Yeah? Otherwise, it's very traumatic. This is one of the reasons why dying is so hard. Because you are faced with the prospect of having to abandon everything you have lived for for 70, 60, 80, 90 yeah, years, whatever it is. Everything has to go. And you have spent your whole life building this up. It is very, very difficult. That is one of the reasons why dying is so, so hard. So if we are get wise about this, uh, if we take into account the idea of rebirth, uh, we understand that we should have a different kind of investment strategy. Uh, yeah, investment strategy. I always say that monks are investment advisors. Uh, that's why I'm talking about investment strategies. And now I'm going to teach you how to advise, how to invest more wisely. Uh, so if you expand out from the present life uh, and you look at the multi-life thing, uh, well, what is the thing that you take with you from one life to the next one? Eh? Well, I just explained that before, in a sense. Uh, I explained that before because I said that through living well, through doing the right thing, through being kind, through being generous, uh, you're building up a very positive mind state. Uh, you're building up a consciousness that is bright, that is beautiful, that is light, that has all these good qualities. Uh, and because you build that up in this life, uh, the moment you die, that is the consciousness that you take with you into the future. Uh, yeah? So the consequences of uh, thinking in terms of rebirth is that it changes the equation for what we should invest in. Uh, instead of investing everything into this life, uh, making this life the be-all and end-all of how we live and what we do, uh, we start to think long-term. Uh, how do you think long-term? What is the difference between thinking short-term and long-term? Uh, well, the difference is that if you think short-term, uh, you think about all the what's in this life, what I can get now, what sort of... Uh, uh, the goals that are only concerned with this particular life. Uh, but if you start to think long term, if you expand it out to include rebirth, uh, it is not the goals that are so important anymore. It is the process by which you achieve those goals that actually matter far more. It is the how we live that that matters, uh, rather than the uh, what we gain in this particular life. Uh. So it is only a small change, yeah? It doesn't mean that you have to become a monk straight away. If you want to become a monk or nun, great, but you don't have to. That's good news already for, for some of you, especially if you have other obligations and things, yeah? So, but what it means is that it changes your outlook. It changes your idea of how you live. You start to change how you live your family life. You start to change how you live your professional life. You start to change even how you deal with you know, all your friends and acquaintances. And you start to focus much more on the how I live. How can I live with more kindness, <coughs> with more generosity, with more wisdom, with more peace, with more compassion in my heart? And that is the final 
uh, not the final, that is one of the very powerful outcomes uh, of thinking about rebirth in the right way. Your investment strategy changes. I told you I'm an investment advisor. If you want to follow my advice, uh, this is how you do it. Uh, and then uh, you are using the idea as a rebirth and karma in the right way. And it becomes a very powerful force for good in your own life. Uh, and it improves your own life. It improves the life of the people around you. And generally, everything becomes far better as a consequence. Uh, and we all become a beacon of light in the world. Yeah, we need more beacons of light in this world. you agree with that? Uh, yeah, too much darkness sometimes. So let us at least do the best we can to be beacons of light. And then we have done what we can do for this world. Uh, Okay, I've spoken over time already, so I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> so, you are now welcome to ask any questions you like, to make comments or whatever else. We can st yeah, start in the back there, please. Uh. Yeah, if I may, um, I thank you very much for your talk, which I enjoyed very much. And I felt very helpful um, and useful. Um, but on the topic of rebirth, uh, I think one of the aspects about rebirth, or one of the <coughs> things about rebirth that I've always struggled a little bit with was that in some way I found it hard to reconcile the idea of rebirth with the teaching of not self. Yeah. Namely, yeah. who or what is reborn yeah. if yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this perception or this feeling that we all share uh, that there's something um, fixed and, and not uh, subject to this condition rising all the time and we refer to as ourselves yeah. basically me, myself and I if, if, if this is, is an illusion then yeah. how come yeah. that, that this illusion then becomes um, true when I die and, and yeah. it goes on to another life so that's yeah. something that yeah. kind of doesn't sure. sit squarely with me. Yeah. But probably because of the superficiality. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Uh, the sure. Point, okay. Yeah, yeah please. Do that very yep. quickly and then I'll come. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> is that I forget now, uh, I apologize, which discourse of the Buddha it was, but there was one particular discourse in which he, he was asked by someone, as is often the case, he was. Yeah. Uh, at least these courses, whether the Tathagata would, ex would exist yeah, yeah, after yeah. death, yeah. and he refused to answer. Now, yeah. Uh, yeah. again, yeah. The, the question arises, why would he refuse to answer? Why would he yeah. just say, well, of course, because there is rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. Like a straightforward yeah. answer wasn't provided, and maybe there was a reason for that. And I yeah, there are some very good reasons for that, and I can explain them to you if you like, and I, because uh, this is, you know, what we do as a monks, we kind of get professional about this kind of stuff. So <laughs> I probably, prob maybe I can answer it. I can at least answer it from my point of view, and then you can see whether you're satisfied or not. So, uh, but the first one is the idea of how can a rebirth happen without a soul or a self that actually goes across? Yeah, this is the first thing you're asking. How come we don't have a soul, and then suddenly when you, as you said, you get reborn, then somehow it materializes, it enables you to get reborn in a future life. But that is not what is happening. Yeah? This is actually not what is going on. Because uh, in one sense, the uh, movement from one life to the next one is actually exactly the same as the movement you have in this very life right now. So what is happening in this very life? Uh, you know, who are you now compared to who you were 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Are you the same or are you different? Uh, Bit of both, yeah? Bit of the same, bit of different, yeah? If you look yourself in the mirror, you look different, but you can also recognize yourself to some extent. Uh, your mental content, there's some similarity and some difference. Uh, there's some memories that are still there, that kind of were there already at that time. Uh, so there's both similarity, both continuity and change happening at the same time. And it's exactly the same thing that happens in the rebirth process. There's no difference. Uh, after all, it is your mind that carries on. Uh, your mind is the majority of what you are now, uh, yeah? That stream of consciousness that you call the mind right now is also the same stream that happens and continues after you pass away and continues in the future life. So there is no problem there. It's just that the mind, the stream of consciousness, is a self-perpetuating phenomenon, yeah, which is perpetuated through craving itself. And because it is self-perpetuating, there's no need for an essential essence that is the real you to carry it on from one life to the next one. And this is kind of this is and this is very profound because this is exactly what is one of the insights of the Buddha. Uh, if you want to read an interesting sutta, you sound like you're interested in the suttas. Uh, I would recommend you go to the uh, 
the Sangyutta Nikaya, the collected discourse of the Buddha, go to the Nidana Sangyutta, the, the uh, 12th Sangyutta. In the Sangyutta discourse number 15, is called the Kachanagota Sutta, and it is precisely a sutta about this, how uh, the Buddha's vision of dependent arising is the middle way between eternalism, that's what you're talking about, the self going on is eternalism, is the middle way between eternalism on the one side and annihilationism on the other side, which is basically the fact that, or the idea that you die, when you die, you pass away and you're gone forever. Yeah? Yeah? That is exactly what that sutta is about. Uh, so it shows you how this actually works. Uh, it is quite a, uh, it's a profound sutta, and when you read it, you may not be able to draw out all the implications of the suttas, but you will find uh, good commentaries available on that sutta if you're interested. It's a very famous sutta, and one of the suttas that have been the source for so much discussion in Buddhism since the time of Nagarjuna, going back, you know, they discussed this particular sutta be precisely because it had a very interesting and profound message. Yeah. But the other point you're talking about, about the, uh, uh, the, four, the tetralemma of the Tathagata, yeah, the Tathagata, does he exist, not exist, both exist, not exist, neither exist, nor not exist, after, after he dies. Uh, and uh, uh, remember, this was a tetralemma that existed in India prior to the time of the Buddha. This was something that was drawn into Buddhism, and the Buddha would give his particular answer to this tetralemma. And because it was something that already existed at the time, it also had a lot of baggage with it. Uh, and the baggage is the baggage of the existing Brahmanical culture. Uh, and that Brahmanical culture had, well, it had one of the ideas of that culture was the idea of eternalism or the idea of anni anni annihilationism because you have the Samanizer. So when you ask, when somebody asks the Buddha, does the Buddha exist after death? If he says no, he's siding on the anni annihilationist side. If he says yes, he's siding on the eternalist side. But you have to actually first have an insight into the Buddha's teachings, have an insight into dependent origination. Only then is it possible to understand what this tetralemma actually means from Buddhist point of view. So what you have to look at in the city, you have to look at who the interlocutor is, who is he talking to, yeah? who, what kind of background do they have, uh, and then only then can you actually assess uh, why the conversation is taking that particular direction and is taking in that particular situation. Yeah. In other words, he refused to side with either extremists. Because they're both wrong from the Buddhist yeah, point of view. Yeah, 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 that's what it is. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. But we also, as beings, are yeah. very imperfect. Yeah. We have a lot of biases, yeah. uh, some of which are due to evolution. Mm. Uh, we evolved uh, towards ignorance sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and it's really hard for me to know, in certain instances, whether something I'm doing is right or wrong. Yeah. Okay. An example of that is obviously eating meat, because yeah. other people eat meat, yeah. and they don't really think about it, because they've been, in a way, conditioned by society to accept it as being yeah. normal. Yeah. Yeah. But it creates suffering. And you have a lot of other examples, for instance, like giving birth, yeah. having children. Yeah. You may consider that it's also giving suffering in a sense. And that's to me is, is, is quite complicated because obviously you have sort of the guide the guidelines, the precepts, which prescribe certain behaviors yeah. and that's very helpful. Yeah. But in other instances it's really hard to make certain decisions yeah. Yeah. because you're never sure whether your, it's your conditioning or your biases speaking, or is it coming from some kind of rational or yeah. maybe the heart? I don't know, but yeah. like, what's driving this yeah. type of decision? Okay, sure. So what you have to do is you have to do things gradually, yeah? And you have to start to uncover layers inside of yourself because mm -hmm. these things happen in layers. That's some. Uh, some actions that are obviously harmful, yeah? yeah? You feel angry and you want to express that anger outward towards somebody else and you can feel that you're coming from the wrong place. You can, you know this is immoral, you know it straight away. Yeah. Or you are very greedy, yeah? Your parents are getting old and they have a large inheritance. You think euthanasia is becoming available. Now how can I kind of, yeah? Obviously very immoral yeah. because you're coming from greed. Yeah. So uh, what you do is you start off with the most, the worst things in, inside of yourself. You look into your heart, and how can I be more, there's already a lot to be done already, yeah? If you take the most coarse aspect in us, everybody gets angry too often. I get angry sometimes, yeah? I feel bad, terrible about it. I still get angry sometimes, not that often, sometimes it happens. So what we do, we start with those things. And as you start, and eliminating anger isn't that difficult. Yeah, it, it may sound difficult, but with the right outlook, with the right, uh, attention and perspective on other people, you can eliminate a large part of anger in fairly uh, short course of time if you really want to. Uh, 
So you start with that, uh, and as you do that, as the anger gets, gets eliminated, uh, new things come to the surface, yeah? new defilements that are less defilements. Then you deal with those. Uh, and this is one of the things that we find in the suttas. The Buddha always says the training of the mind is a gradual thing. It's like the refining of gold. You don't start refining the most refined things out of the gold. You start with the coarse things. Then the middling defilements, then the very refined ones. It's exactly the same thing here. And as you do this, you start to uncover your own motivations. Uh, the motivations are ultimately what decides whether something is moral or not. Yeah? What is your motivation for doing something? Is it selfish? Uh, is it anger? Is it delusion? Uh, and after a while you uncover the motivations and you can move gradually towards purity. That is how you do it. Uh, ultimately it is possible to reach full purity according to Buddhist, Buddhist ideas. But I wanted to also mention very briefly about, because you said about uh, giving birth to a child. Is that bad or is it good? Well, remember, whether you do it or not, they're going to have to be reborn. Yeah. So if you are a good Buddhist, if you are a kind-hearted person, bring a few children into your life. Bring them up well, do something good for them, and you're probably doing a positive thing for the world. Yeah? They're going to have to be reborn anyway, yeah? from a Buddhist perspective. Yeah? So no choice in the matter. It's not you bring them out, they're bringing themselves out, essentially. Yeah? <laughs> okay, yes? I recognize you, you're coming everywhere. To all, all the, yeah, that's really cool, okay, yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Mindful Sampajanya, okay. Um, so please let us know, it doesn't matter if, you, if we go too far, so you, you are the boss and I'm happy to just follow orders, yeah? So just... Uh, last one, yeah? Sure, and it's a quite involved question anyway, so... Yeah, it is a, good, it is a very good one. Yeah. So what is, how do we define mindfulness in Sampajanya? And mindfulness, the most... I mean, in the, the Buddhist word for mindfulness is sati. And uh, sati has two meanings in the Pali language. First of all, it means memory. Uh, but the other meaning, which is more important from meditation perspective, <coughs> is just the ability to be in the present moment. Uh, yeah? So it is if you are uh, able to kind of be in the here and now without fantasizing about things, by like going into the future, going into the past, uh, the ability to stay in the present moment is what sati is about. Uh. So if you try to do your meditation practice, uh, if your sati is well established, meditation is incredibly easy because you're already in the present moment, your breath is also in the present moment, so you just apply that sati to the breath and it happens automatically. Yeah. So that is how you find out how good your mindfulness is. Uh, yeah? If you can't follow the breath, it means your mindfulness is uh, not as good as it could be. Yeah. So you improve it more. I was trying to be diplomatic, yes. Yeah? So, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being naughty again, so I apologize. Sir. So I like being naughty because I'm a disciple of Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? He also likes to be naughty, so I'm just following, following kind of instructions here. Yeah? So, uh, Sampajanya, on the other hand, is more a wisdom aspect, which very often goes together with sati. Yeah? And Sampajanya is really the ability to know whether what you're doing now is going to lead you forward on the path or not. Uh, yeah? So, if you, for example, you, uh, if you have awareness of the present moment, uh, and you can feel that something is uh, starting to give rise to anger inside of you, Sampajanya kicks in and tells you, I'm heading in the wrong direction, I'm about to get angry, I need to change my object of awareness, I need to focus in a different way in this particular situation. Sampajanya is what tells you whether what you are doing is purposeful and suitable for the development of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? Purposeful and suitable for the development of the Noble Eightfold Path. So Sampajanya and mindfulness, they have to go hand in hand, because if you have to be mindful, to be able to be clear about whether you are doing the right thing or not. Uh, and then you can change tack and you can move in a different direction. Uh, so the two things are kind of uh, two sides of a, you know, of a very kind of important coin in the Buddhist practice. <coughs> That's the brief answer. Uh, are you happy with that? Uh? Yes. Absolutely happy? Yeah? Uh, yeah? Ecstatic? Uh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, that is all for tonight. Uh, Mr. President, uh, please. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. It's a really wonderful talk. Huh? I think you'll be talking some more, won't you? We have some further places where you'll be. We are teaching. going up to the peak this week. Are you doing a retreat? You'll be doing yeah. a retreat. Can people yeah. come to the retreat? It's already it's overbooked, I think. Yeah. Booked yeah. Out within a week. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. Will you be talking? And after the retreat, we'll talk. <coughs> yes, after you are the boss of the Yeah. In yeah. Muscle Square. It's on our website. It's on the website. Yeah. 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 What is the website? Uh, Anukampa Project. 